or God. Tonight's speakers, Pastor James Burns Jr. from the Memorial Presbyterian Church in Norman, Oklahoma, and Dr. Jamal Badawi, Professor, St. Mary's University, Halifax, Canada. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. All praise is due to Allah, Creator, Sustainer and cherisher of the universe. And may his peace and blessings be upon his last messenger, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and on all messengers which preceded him, peace be upon them. Respective guests, my brothers and sisters in Islam and in humanity, I greet you all tonight with the greeting of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May the peace and blessings of Allah be with you all. We, the Muslim Student Association, University of Oklahoma chapter, here in Norman, Oklahoma, welcome you all, each and every one of you tonight, to a Christian and Muslim dialogue. This dialogue will investigate the main difference between Islam and Christianity. That is the nature of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And the topic to be discussed is whether Jesus, peace be upon him, is Christ, man, myth or God. At this point in time, I wish to both introduce and welcome our two speakers tonight who will participate in this dialogue. Sitting on the left, we have Reverend uh, Burns, Jim Burns, who is a pastor at Memorial Church, uh, Memorial Presbyterian Church in Norman. He has been here now two years. He attended Texas A&M University, and he received his BS degree in physics in 1965. He went on and um, obtained his, uh, his MS in physics in 1967, in which he did research at Oak Ridge National Laboratories in Atomic Physics. And also he went on to his PhD in physics as well and finished it in 1970 and did the research in nuclear physics at Texas A&M, Texas A&M's Cyclotron Institute. Reverend Burns then taught physics and engineering for four years at A&M, Texas A&M, at Moody College in Galveston, Texas. He then attended Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminar Seminary from 1974 to 1977, in which he received a Master of Divinity from the school. He then left seminary and began work as Presbyterian minister in Lone Oak, Arkansas. So we welcome uh, Reverend Burns tonight for this dialogue. The second speaker, who will participate in our dialogue is sitting on the right and he is Dr. Jamal Badawi who is a professor at St. Uh, Mary's University in Halifax, Canada. Before starting the dialogue I wish to bring to your attention the following points. The order and the timing of each of the speakers has been mutually agreed upon before the event. Therefore, Dr. Jamal Bedoui will start the speech for 35 minutes, and then Dr. Uh, Reverend Jim Burns will also speak for 35 minutes after that. We will then have our question and answer session, and uh, in the end, each one will have an option of five minutes to, for closing comments if he wishes to do so. And before I finish, brothers and sisters in humanity and in Islam, I wish to say, that I realize each one of you has set aside valuable time when he came or she came here tonight to listen to this dialogue. And uh, there are some of us who have come here from different states. They have traveled far away to come listen. Therefore, I pray to God that you will all find what you have come looking for and that you leave this event learning more about the truth behind the topic being discussed 
That is, is Jesus Christ man, myth, or God? And I'd like to welcome now the first speaker, Dr. Jamal Bedoui. Will she'll speak for 35 minutes? Alhamdulillah, wa salat wa salam ala Rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa anwala. All grace is due to Allah, the creator, sustainer, and cherisher of the universe. May his peace and blessings be upon his last messenger Muhammad and upon all messengers before him, from Noah to Abraham to Moses, Jesus, and finally Muhammad. Peace and blessing be upon them all. I begin first by greeting you with the traditional Islamic greeting, Assalamu Alaikum, peace be with you. I thank Allah for giving me the opportunity to be with you at a very short notice. And I am thankful to um, Reverend Byrne for accepting the invitation also to participate in this dialogue. And I'd like to acknowledge also uh, among those who are present a very prominent theologian, uh, Dr. Floyd Clark, with whom I had the pleasure of moderating uh, discussion between him and Ahmed Didat in Britain and his friend also Reverend uh, Bay So welcome to them and welcome to you all and I appreciated the opportunity. There is no religion in the world outside of Christianity itself which makes it an article of faith to believe in, to love and honor and respect Jesus outside of Christianity except Islam. No other religion, including Judaism, shares this with Christianity. The teaching of the Quran with that respect is echoed by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when in one of his sayings said, quote, I am the nearest, that is the nearest in love to Jesus, son of Mary, in this world and in the next. The prophets are brothers, son of one father. Their mothers are different, but their religion is one. There has been no prophet between us. Not only was Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who spoke with respect and love about his predecessor, Jesus, peace be upon him, but according to the Quran also, it shows that Jesus, peace be upon him, spoke with the same respect and love to his successor, Prophet Muhammad, and actually he directed his followers to follow him should he come in their lifetime. In one sense then, we find that Islam and Christianity share a very important common link, as I call it. But, paradoxically enough, as the chairman indicated in the beginning, while this is a very important beginning, it is also the nature of Jesus that is the basic reason of difference in understanding in theology between Islam and Christianity. But that leads us to inquire as to how could we possibly conduct a fruitful type of dialogue beyond exchanging pleasantries. In order to facilitate presentation, an outline has been passed on, so make sure you get one from any of the ushers if you haven't got any. But as you notice in the first section, I suggested that there could be possibly a number of approaches towards the so-called comparative Christology between Islam and Christianity. Either we could examine the authority and authenticity of both scriptures based upon which the perception or interpretation of Jesus, peace be upon him, is based, or to examine the historical developments of various uh, dogmas or doctrines, both in Islam and Christianity, in the hope of trying to discern something about exactly who Jesus was. Or thirdly, to leave these two questions basically aside, and take both the scriptures as they stand today, the Quran and the Bible, as they are, and try to examine both scriptures with the view of leaving open the question that one community of believers or the other 
might have either misinterpreted its own scriptures or somebody else's scripture, at least to open the door for a possibility of a more fresh look into both the Quran and the Bible. I am going to begin even by opening the Quran itself for investigation. It is well known that Muslims uphold that Jesus, peace be upon him, was a human being, nothing but a great messenger and prophet of God, that he never claimed divinity, nor was a person in a triune godhood. But the question sometimes is raised as to whether Muslims might have not really understood or interpreted the Quran accurately. In the second section, I try to summarize in point form with all documentation available in the outline, basically what the Quran says about Jesus, peace be upon him. First, that his mother Mary is immensely praised in the Quran. The Quran speaks about the virgin birth of Jesus and compare it with the creation of Adam from neither man or woman and compare it also with a lesser miracle of the birth of John the Baptist from an old father and a barren mother. The Quran called Jesus a word from God or Allah, a term which refers to other human beings as well, a spirit from Allah which is used in the Quran to refer to other humans. He is described in the Quran as one who is honored in this life and the hereafter one who is among those who are closest to God and that expression appears in the Quran with respect to angels and great prophets and pious people only. He is described as a pure child, the same description that was given in the Quran to John the Baptist and the same that is consistent with Muslim beliefs that every child is born innocent and pure. The Quran says that he was strengthened with the Holy Spirit he performed miracles according to the Quran by the power and permission of his creator, by the power of Allah. That he taught what all other prophets before him taught, to worship Allah or God alone, not to associate others with him in his divine attributes. The Quran indicates that his mission was directed towards the Israelites, that he was teaching basically what all other prophets taught that the Quran does not only negate what our Christian brethren considers as heretical interpretation in early Christianity but the Quran speaks as well also about Trinity as not the explanation of the nature of Jesus the Quran indicates that he was rejected by the Israelites there was a conspiracy to crucify him which failed but as the Quran says it so appeared to them there was some confusion and they thought that it was Jesus who was crucified and finally that Jesus peace be upon him echoed what other many other prophets in the Old Testament prophesied about the advent of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him he repeated the same thing this kind of profile as was described by a Christian writer Rizanin in an article published by the Muslim world that this is a very impressive profile of a man who acted as a prophet and messenger of God with this kind of honor that is bestowed on Jesus and his mother in the Quran. I think if we have opened the Quran for investigation it would only be fair and reasonable at least from my humble understanding as a Muslim as well as the understanding of many biblical scholars also throughout history to inquire as to whether there could be a possible interpretation or reinterpretation of the Bible as it stands today regardless of the issue of authenticity and authority that might in fact not be too far away from what the Quran says in a more clear term so I'm turning now to Roman 3 in the following page Jesus in the Bible the essence of the presentation of that section is summarized in the first two points. The Muslim upholds that even by investigating the Bible itself, we find that the Old Testament does not really provide any foundation for the concept of Trinity or the notion of God incarnate. Secondly, that even in the New Testament, 
There is no conclusive statements made by Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, during his ministry, which very clearly indicate that he claimed to be God or to be divine. However, it is not enough to make statements in a dogmatic manner like that, as the Quran teaches the followers, bring forth your evidence if you are truthful, at least the evidence that you see, at least for the purpose of discussion. From my limited, humble understanding of, Bible, of the Bible and Christian literature on that issue, it appears to me that at least five f basic foundations for the deity of Jesus can be discerned. One is what has been said about Jesus or written about him. Two, what is attributed to him as claiming for himself as divine. Three, his miracles. For the issue of the salvation through the bloodshed, the loving concern of God by sending Jesus or reconciling the world uh, to himself. And fifthly, the issue of personal experience uh, or mystery. Let me touch briefly on each. Some of them might take longer time than the other. But the first one would not take much time really. In a very serious matter, as believing in the creator of heavens and earth and all of this universe, a serious matter like that, one cannot base simply on witness made by other people. If anyone comes to me and say so and so who lived in any particular point of time was God in flesh, that itself is not a sufficient ground for me to determine a belief that would ultimately determine my destiny. In fact, we know from history that a lot of people have been deified by their followers Krishna, Buddha, and many other kings and rulers throughout history but the main question really that should be raised here did any of those claim indeed to be God incarnate? So I think the second question perhaps seemed to be the central question that might open the floor for some uh, sort of discussion and exchange of opinion as uh, Reverend Burns perhaps might present the Christian viewpoint Let's take this idea of what Jesus claimed for himself or believed to have claimed for himself and let me divide it into two areas the positive statements and the negative statements by positive statements I mean the issues that usually arise in the context of Muslim Christian dialogue or discussion to show that Jesus indeed claimed to be divine I had a list of 15 common questions like this and I just like to deal with them very briefly and quickly. First, it is said that Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes unto the Father but by me. From a Muslim standpoint, he says yes in a special way. Amen. There is no dispute in that. Every prophet in his time speaks for God. And there is only one true way leading to God, the, the truth revealed by God, all other ways are false and as such the prophet actually represents literally the way that God has revealed to mankind in that sense Moses was the way the truth and life in his time so was Jesus so was all great prophets Two, that Jesus said I and the father are one John 10:30. but again did he mean oneness in essence or oneness in purpose and spiritual communion the Bible itself answers in John 17, 11 and verses 20 through 23, we find that Jesus also referred to his oneness with his disciples. If Jesus meant to be one with God in essence, then all disciples also must be divine because he said there is oneness also between himself and the disciples. Obviously, the oneness here is in purpose. Three, that Jesus said in 14, 9 in John, that whoever has seen him, he has seen the Father. But again, we all know that the term see does not necessarily see with the naked eye, but see also means knowledge. Whoever knows me and follows me, he knows the Father and he follows the Father. And this is not uh, totally far-fetched, because we find that in the Bible itself, in the book of Exodus, in chapter 33, verse 20, it says clearly that nobody can see God and lives. 
in the New Testament in John 1.18, 5.37 and 14.7, it again clearly says that nobody ever saw God or heard his voice. So obviously Jesus will not say, I am God, so whoever has seen me, he has seen God because I am God. Fourth, it is attributed to Jesus in John 8.58 that he said before Abraham, I am. But first of all, if one wanted to be very literal, he didn't say before Adam, just before Abraham, if you really want to be literal. But this is not really what is meant. After all, the angels were before Abraham and before Adam even. That is not really a foundation for claiming of divinity, because everything did exist in the knowledge of God before anything came to being. The notion of the term used by Jesus, I am, that it was used by God in Exodus, that it says there is an analogy there. I think this question needs to be examined carefully because if somebody asks me and he says, are you Jamal Badawi? And I say, yes, I am. It doesn't mean that I am claiming divinity because God happened to use the term I am also in the book of Exodus. Five, it is said that Jesus accepted worship of others as we find in Mark 14.33. But we all know that worship also does not mean necessarily believing in somebody as God. People worship money, worship their jobs. Worship means intense love also. But we find even more clear evidence in Luke 5.16 that Jesus himself worshipped God and taught his followers to worship God. Obviously, he did not believe himself to be the object of worship. Six that Jesus was called Son of God. But according to the Bible, Adam also was called Son of God, Luke 3, 38. So was Abraham, Jeremiah 31, 9. So was Jacob, Exodus 4, 22. David, 2 Samuel 7, 14. Solomon, 1 Chronicle 22, 10. More than one prophet, in fact, were, co were called firstborn. Firstborn. And never to mean the first chronologically but mean best but best doesn't mean the only best because Abraham Jacob and David all of them were called firstborn of God in different places in the Bible some prophets even were called begotten as we find uh, pertaining to David in the second Psalm of David in verse 7 even the term only son has been used in the Bible not to ta be taken literally in the book of Genesis, chapter 22, verse 2, the term only son is not used literally as it refers to Isaac while Ishmael was already there. It was used also in uh, Genesis 6, 2, Deuteronomy 14, 1, Hosea 1, 10. All of these are evidence from both the Old and New Testament. Seven, that Jesus called God Father or Abba. But he also said, my father and your father, as we find in John 12, 20, 17. Even in the book of Romans and in Galatians, in Romans 8, 15, in Galatians 4, 6, we find that other people also may call God Abba, a more intimate term. Eight, that he was called Messiah. Messiah in Hebrew in, is Mashiach, in Arabic is Messiah, which means anointed. The Bible shows that David also was Messiah. Psalm 2, uh, two. Cyrus uh, was also called the Messiah, Isaiah 45, 1. 9, that Jesus was called Savior. So was Jehu Ahaz in 2 Kings 13, 5. The term Messiah was used also in plural in the book of Obadiah, verse 21, in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 27. 10, that he was called Lord. But any reader of the Old Testament realizes that Lord was not always meant to be the God or the one and only Lord. Lord is used also in a sense of rabbi, master, or teacher. Eleven, that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. But that is not a claim for divinity because the Bible in Mark 1.15 shows that John the Baptist also was filled with the Holy Spirit. So was St. Barnabas in Acts 11.24. 12. That he is attributed to have said that my words will not pass away, and that's a claim of divinity. But again, in John 14, 24, Jesus says that what he says is not his own word, but the Father who sent him, which means my word, my, the God's word, will not pass away. 13. 
that it is attributed to him as have said all authority in heavens and earth has been given to me if we were to take that literally it means that the authority of the father ceases to exist that there is no position for the Holy Spirit and as such Trinity does not exist anymore if all authority in heavens and earth has been given to the Son obviously it doesn't mean that at all and even when he says given to me that means someone greater than me gave it to me or else how could I get it without his permission 14 that he was called by Thomas my Lord and my God in John 20 verse 28 but again we have to stop here and wonder whether Thomas really after resurrection according to the Bible was expressing admiration and surprise by saying my Lord Jesus and my God meant God but not Jesus but even if this meant to apply to Jesus it could also very easily mean you are God like a metaphorical expression and that is not very uh, difficult to discern in view of the fact that Paul in 1st Corinthians chapter 8 verse 6 makes it clear that there is only one God and one Lord that is Jesus Christ so the distinction between God and Lord is made distinct 15 the Jews tried to stone him for blasphemy and if they understood him to say son of God in that sense that was used in the Old Testament why did they want to accuse him of blasphemy as we find in chapter 10 of the Gospel of John but we all realize that the Jews were trying to indict Jesus you might say by hook or by crook he accused them of hypocrisy he accused them of all kinds of things and they had the religious establishment had every reason to want to get rid of him one of the Siaphas the high priest was quoted once as saying that it is more expedient for one man to die rather than the nation on the other hand the question is still open as to whether the Jews consider Jesus blaspheming for claiming to be the Messiah because he differed from the image of the Messiah that they thought of one who is going to lead them into victory but what is more important in addressing this issue is the answer given by Jesus himself peace be upon him in John 10:34, when he said to his accusers is it not written in your law that ye are gods according to some scholars they say that this perhaps is referring to the 89 Psalm of David verse 6 when even human beings allegorically are called gods even in the book of Exodus in chapter 7 verse 1 it says that God sent Moses as God to the Pharaoh nobody have ever interpreted that to mean that Moses was incarnation of God but God like or representative of God this is the context in which Jesus spoke to people who knew their Old Testament this is what I call the positive statements that are sometimes presented as presenting an evidence of Jesus claim of divinity admittedly they may be others but these are the most common ones as most of you might be able to judge but what is sometimes not quoted in which I believe that a seminar like that would be useful in exchanging information and opening our minds and hearts to each other's views that there is much more conclusive and clear statements in the New Testament in which Jesus negated his divinity I listed only ten of them but there could be more one he indicated that he does nothing on his own authority John 530 1431 and Matthew 20 verse 23 two he indicated that he did not speak on his own authority but what the father ordained him to say John 14 10 also chapter 8 verses 28 and 29 3 which is a very conclusive statement he indicated that the father is greater than himself John 14 28 4 the Bible says in Matthew 4 verses 1 to 11 that Jesus was tempted by the Satan but according to the book of James in the Bible chapter 1 verse 13 God cannot be tempted and it would be totally pointless for Satan to try to tempt the creator of heavens and earth or to offer him the kingdom that he himself owns and created and say I'll give you that if you bow down to me the one who's tempted is only and fully human being who resisted that temptation nobly as Jesus did five Jesus denied the knowledge of the unseen which is a paramount characteristic of the divine 
We find that in Luke 13, 32, in Matthew 24, 36. Six, Jesus was subject to change. He was mutable. We find that in Luke 2, 21, and also in verse 52. And we all know that God is immutable. For example, when it says that Jesus increased in knowledge and wisdom. God does not increase in knowledge and wisdom. His knowledge and wisdom is eternal and perfect from the beginning. Seven, he did not accept to be called good when somebody says good master to him. And definitely he deferred to God as we find clearly in Mark chapter 10 verse 18. Eight, Jesus himself prayed to God. Prayer is nothing but a petition from a helpless creature of God to the one who has the authority, to his creator and the creator of all. How could Jesus, if he were God, pray to himself? How could he pray even to the, sec to the first person in Trinity because the definition shows that they are all equal in power? We find that in Mark 14.32, in Luke 5.16. Nine, Jesus referred to himself as a prophet. Luke 13, 33 and 4, other people also believed into him and referred to him as a prophet. Luke 7, 16, 24, 19, John 6, 14 and 40, Hebrew 3, 1. He was referred to as a servant of God. Act 3, 13, 4, 27 and 30, Matthew 12 and 18. Now, he also finally made a distinction between himself and the Father. We find that clearly in Matthew chapter 23 verses 8 to 10. And may I add one comment at this point of one Christian scholar, a well-known Francis Young, when he said that Jesus, if you look at the titles given to him, there is only one title that has been very common that Jesus constantly and consistently referred to himself by, and that is the Son of Man. From both the positive and negative evidence, we can conclude in an answer to the second question, did Jesus really claim to be divine? In my humble understanding, definitely not. That leads us to the third question on the last page. Some might say the birth of Jesus, his miracles and his life is in itself a testimony that speak louder than words. It shows that he was divine even if he did not say that in so many words. But again, if we investigate the Bible itself, I'm not talking about other sources, we will find that no miracle attributed to Jesus was not attributed to someone else in the Old Testament. Even virgin birth has been attributed to Melchizedek, not really virgin birth, but it says in Hebrew uh, chapter 7 verse 3, that Melchizedek was born without a father, without a mother, there is no beginning or end to his days. Obviously that has to be taken, not literally, but if we were really to say, all right, there is no other, even the Bible shows that there is even a greater miracle than the creation of Jesus, peace be upon him. Furthermore, according to the Quran also, and just, uh, if I add that as a footnote in the midst of all these biblical references, addresses the question of the virgin birth of Jesus, in a very beautiful and succinct verse in the Qur'an that says, in the translation of meaning, Indeed, the similitude in G of Jesus in the sight of God is like that of Adam. He created him, that God created Adam from dust, and he said to him, Be, and he was. That shows that the wonderful forms of creation of the Almighty God is four. One is to create a human from both a man and woman's side, which is every one of us in this hall, you and me. I suppose, I didn't see any dissent from that. Secondly, is to create someone from neither man's side or woman's side, that was Adam. And in that sense, Adam even would be a greater miracle in creation. Three, to create a human being from a man's side, but not a woman's side, that was Eve. There was one form of miraculous creation that was not achieved yet, and God wanted to complete all four to create a human from a woman's side, but not from a man's side, and that was Jesus, peace and blessing be upon him. When we speak about feeding the multitudes, or walking on water, healing the leper and blind, bringing the dead to life, casting the devils, arising from the death, and ascending even to heaven, we find that mentioned in many places in the Bible, and I have given the quotations all in the outline, especially in the second book of Kings, in the book of Ezekiel and in other places. 
We come finally, or close to finally, I should say, to the fourth issue. That it is not important really whether Jesus claimed it or not, but it is mainly the notion of the love of God and his forgiving mercy by reconciling the world to himself by sending Jesus to die for us. But that again seems to be based on a number of assumptions which are from a Muslim understanding questionable. To assume first of all that all human beings were created perfect. The Muslim would say if they were perfect, if Adam was totally perfect, he would have not been capable of disobeying God and eating from the forbidden tree. God created the human from dust, which is a symbol of materialism, which means that a human being is temptable by his very nature. It assumes also the necessity of bloodshed for forgiveness. And nowhere in the Quran do we find any trace of this idea that God requires the bloodshed, especially of the innocent, in order to forgive. The Quran speaks about repentance, sincere repentance to God who knows our weakness and our intentions. And furthermore, it is impossible to think of Jesus as the sacrifice, the perfect and infinite sacrifice for all mankind unless we assume that he was both man and God at the same time. But if we were to have that assumption, it would raise the question as to who died on the cross. According to Judaism, Christianity and Islam, to say that God died is a blasphemy against God. So the normal argument is that the one who died on the cross was Jesus the human, not the divine. But if only Jesus the human died on the cross, it is neither the infinite or perfect sacrifice, for the birth of one man cannot take away the sins of all humanity. That leaves us in a very difficult situation if we were still to insist that Jesus was both man and God simultaneously. But aside from this issue, the notion of the dual nature of Jesus, the dual parenthood of Jesus, parentage of being the son of David and son of God at the same time, is difficult to reconcile. Indeed, we find many biblical scholars who are practicing Christians, some of whom have been clergy, in fact, people who are sympathetic to Christianity rather than atheists or critics of it, have indicated quite clearly that the, this notion of reconciling humanity to divinity is not really the original teaching of Jesus. Let me give you a couple of examples very quickly as I have only about four minutes left. In the volume edited by John Hick called The Myth of God Incarnate, we find that in the introduction it shows clearly that the idea of God incarnate has developed later on as, quote, a mythological or poetic way of expressing the significance of Jesus to us, he says to us as Christians. Uh, Professor Maurice Wiles also indicates quite clearly that the writers of the New Testament were not only reporters, but they were interpreters of Jesus, and they gave him all kinds of titles, a prophet, son of man, Messiah, the Eddy incarnation or incarnation of wisdom, an Old Testament concept. However, he says the first three synoptic gospels stopped short of what developed later on, the full-fledged deification of Jesus that was left to John. He says we can look at the idea of uh, reincarnation of Jesus as an interpretation which was only appropriate in the age which it arose than to treat it as an unalterable truth binding upon all subsequent generations. I could go on and on and on, I have plenty of this, but of course the time is closing. All I am saying that it is not only uh, an opinion of a Muslim brethren who is saying that there is no foundation, that these are reconcilable. Biblical scholars throughout history have uh, objected and raised this whole issue about the dual nature of Jesus that it is simply an impossible proposition to deal with. So let me come briefly in the remaining two minutes to the very last question. That some people say it doesn't matter what proof might be found or not found in the Bible. The proof in, of the pudding is in the eating. But if we were to take experience alone as the foundation, then we find people who are following many religions, many cults even, who can say the same thing, I feel great, I feel in peace by following this ideology. That does not determine ultimate truth. On the other hand, to say that this is a myth, I think, or mystery, uh, seem to really avoid the issue that really needs to be discussed. There is a difference between saying that God is a myth, is a, sorry, God is a mystery, 
and that our human mind is incapable of fully comprehending God, I accept that as a Muslim, just as my Christian brethren also would state it. Yes, God is a mystery. We can't fully comprehend Him. But we can perceive of Him all the time. We can see the signs of His creation and existence in everything around us. So it is not contra-reason, it is not supra-rational to think of God in that term, even though I cannot perceive of Him. But to speak about concept like Trinity or dual nature of Jesus that he never claimed as a mystery, that is a different issue. It is not a mystery. It is an intellectualized concept that some people created and tried to explain, articulate, and argue about it in uh, Christian council after Christian council. And for 2,000 years, it is still subject to argument. It is an intellectualized item, not a mystery. It is human being who uh, proposed that to us, and again to refer to John Hick and his colleagues, actually if you examine carefully the Bible itself, you find that there is latitude and there is a great deal of room to reinterpret the Bible afresh, even from the standpoint of many practicing and learned Christians. Maybe that might close the gap that has existed for 1400 years between Muslims and their Christian brethren. Thank you very much for your patience and may peace and blessing be with you all.